Hey everyone, Hugh McClay here again from iTrack Suspension, here for another thrilling episode of Suspension Kinematics. In the last episode on single pivots, we saw how there was a strong dependency between anti-squat and anti-rise. And in this video, we're going to start to look at some four bar systems and um, see how they can overcome that limitation. But first, let's um, quickly go back to single pivots and just have a look at what's going on here at the back end of the bike that generates these anti-rise and anti-squat figures. Firstly, if we look at anti-rise, we know that the brake caliper is mounted directly on the swing arm. And um, when we're braking, there is a force on the wheel in this direction at this point where the wheel touches the ground. So um, basically that force is acting horizontally on the wheel. And what it's trying to do is um, pull the wheel backwards. So we can see that it's generating a moment about this pivot point because basically the wheel and the swing arm are considered locked together when braking. Um, and the, the distance between this uh, contact patch and the pivot is uh, generating a moment arm. And basically the, the size of that moment arm is what um, roughly uh, generates the anti-rise. So you could imagine if that pivot was much higher up, then the moment arm would be much greater and there'd be um, a much greater amount of anti-rise. Conversely, if the pivot was much lower, say right down on the ground, then um, the moment arm would be very small or zero and um, braking would pull directly through that pivot and there'd be no moment on the swing arm so it, um, it wouldn't move as a result of braking. When we look at anti-squat, the, um, the source of anti-squat is really coming from two kind of Two separate things uh, working together. One source is um, is the angle of this swing arm. So basically, um, as the wheel is um, being driven forwards, um, if this angle is is much steeper, then the wheel kind of wants to to tuck under the bike and, and lift the bike up. Whereas if um, if the swing arm angle is much lower then the wheel won't be able to tuck under the suspension so that's uh that's sort of one source the other main source of anti-squat is really the um the chain here wanting to pull the rear axle closer to the bottom bracket um basically in the direction of the chain line um and so the 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 rate of chain growth um, is an important factor in calculating anti-squat as well. So basically, as the wheel moves through its travel, the distance between the bottom bracket, sorry, the, the rear axle and the bottom bracket changes. Um, and depending on what the gear ratio is, that also affects how much this section of chain grows throughout the suspension travel. And um, that rate of chain growth is a pretty big factor in how the anti-squat is calculated. So um, both of those things, the, the angle of the swing arm line and the rate of chain growth are directly related to this axle path. Fortunately, the graphical method takes all that into account and produces these, these values for anti-squat and anti-rise without us having to worry too much about calculating the rate of chain growth directly or the angle of the swing arm directly. The um, graphical method does it all for us and gives us these values. So basically what we've just spoken about means that um, axle path, for a given drivetrain, axle path will determine the anti-squat and um, the location of this main pivot um, or the instant center when we get onto multi-link designs uh, will determine the anti-rise values. 
So now let's um, look at how we can separate this pivot, which is where the, um, the anti-rise values come from, and the axle path, which is where the anti-squat values come from. On a single pivot system, we can't actually separate those because the main pivot there is what generates the circular axle path, and that main pivot is fixed in one spot. So this is a suspension system where we've basically got a pivot here and a swing arm to the axle. So the axle still follows a circular path, but we've now got the brake caliper mounted on this member here. So the brake caliper doesn't actually rotate about this point. Instead, the brake caliper rotates about the instant center of this member, which is actually this red point out here. So um, some of you might recognize this as a split pivot system. Um, others might recognize it as an ABP system, active braking pivot. Basically, um, in terms of the, the benefits, they're the same thing. Basically, it's like a cross between a single pivot and a four bar system. Basically, the axle path is, um, is generated, or the, the axle is actually um, at the same location as the pivot here. So what that means is you can have the axle considered to be as a single pivot, or you could consider it as a four bar axle path um, and it's basically on the boundary between those two definitions. Um, it's, it's on the pivot location so it's both a single pivot axle path and a four bar axle path. Um, so it's a bit of a special case and that's, uh, that's why we're talking about it. So um, Trek uses this system on a lot of their bikes, they call it the uh, active braking pivot. Um, other brands license um, Dave Weagle's split pivot system, um, which does a similar thing. Um, interestingly, both those uh, patents, there's, they've each got a patent on it, and there's a bit of a battle there. Um, but both of them really talk about how this system works with um, the rocker link and how it drives the shock and the benefits associated with motion ratios. Um, they don't actually talk about the benefits in separating the, the anti-squat from the anti-rise and I think that's because um, it was done a long time ago. So the tricky thing with mounting brake calipers is that basically the caliper has, been, has to be mounted so that it stays in contact with the brake rotor. And as you know, the brake rotor is part of the wheel, so it um, means the brake caliper basically has to be mounted in a way that it always stays in contact with the, um, the rotor. So really it can't move um, radially from the center of the wheel. So that's why with this four bar system and mounting the brake caliper on this member, this pivot down here has to be on the rear axle so that as the suspension moves, um, the caliper stays in contact with the brake rotor. So here's a photo that probably illustrates things a bit better than the stick figures in my software. Um, basically, here's the rear axle and this lower link is the swing arm and basically it comes around here. Um, the brake caliper is attached to this member which is a separate member from the swing arm. These two members rotate about a pivot point which is concentric with the rear axle. So as the suspension moves this member rotates about a different point 
in space compared to the swing arm. So you can imagine as the suspension moves and the axle goes up and down along its circular arc, this um, swing arm will rotate a certain amount, maybe a few degrees or whatever. Um, and if the brake caliper was attached to that, say down here, then um, the brake caliper would also rate, rotate that amount. And basically that amount of rotation, or actually the rate of rotation, um, is very closely related to the amount of anti-rise generated. So you can imagine that um, as, the, uh, as the pads grab onto this rotor and the rotor is rotating, um, the once the pads engage with the rotor then the caliper wants to rotate the same way that the wheel's rotating and what that does is cause the swing arm to to rotate so that's that's what it would be like if the caliper was attached to the swing arm here like on a true single pivot bike um, but by having the caliper up here on this member this member may rotate at a different rate compared to how this member rotates so um, usually this member will rotate less than this member does so um, by having the brake caliper on this member the the wheel rotation and the force going through the caliper has less of an effect on the suspension so what we're able to achieve here is that the, um, the axle still moves about this point here in a circular arc, but the brake caliper doesn't rotate about this point anymore. Instead, the brake caliper rotates about a virtual point out here um, called the instant center. And... Um, Basically, as the suspension moves, that instant center tracks along a, a virtual path here. But by, um, by now projecting that instant center further forward, we get much lower anti-rise figures than we would if it was a single pivot and if the caliper was mounted on, on this member here. So you'll hear me using the term instant center a fair bit so I should probably explain what that is um, basically in a four bar linkage or any sort of planar linkage like this there are several points um, that we can use to understand how forces are transmitted between the members of the linkage and the instant center is um, literally the point of rotation between two bodies so you could imagine in a four bar linkage like this we actually have four bodies that all move in a slightly different way it's called an instant center because we don't really need to know anything about what's happened before the point we're interested in or what's happening after it Basically, you can put the suspension in any position and calculate the position of the instant centers um, purely based on the geometry of that position. So an instant center is the point of rotation between any two bodies. Um, basically, in this linkage, it's a four bar linkage, we've got four bodies. Um, I like to call the the reference frame, which is the front triangle effectively, I like to call that link zero for some reason. Um, this link here is link one. This link is link two. And this link is link three. So because I've numbered one of them zero, there's actually four links there. So between any two of those members, there is an instant center that describes how those two members move relative to each other. So the simplest ones are um, 
what we probably call real ICs or real instant centers. Basically, this pivot point here is the instant center between link zero, which is my reference frame, and link one. This pivot here is the instant center between link one and link two. This pivot here is the instant center between link two and link three. And this pivot here is the instant center between link three and link zero, which is my reference frame. So they're the four real instant centers. Um, there are another two instant centers. Basically, the instant center of this link relative to the reference frame. So the way we find that is by intersecting the lines made by the two adjacent links. So basically a line through this top link and a line through this bottom link and where they intersect is the instant center of this link relative to the, um, the reference frame. So basically, well, where they intersect is that red point. Um, but what it means is that that member at any given position of travel, it's rotating about that red dot. There's also another instant center in this linkage. Um, basically the instant center of this link relative to the top link. Um, it's not significant for what we study in suspension kinematics, but um, basically you could locate it by intersecting this line with this line. So it would be up here somewhere and it would move as the suspension moves just like this one does. So most of the time, the instant center that we're most interested in is the, the, the one of the member carrying the, the back wheel and how that uh, member rotates relative to the um, front triangle. So basically the instant center of this member relative to the, the reference frame. Um, so the way I've numbered these links with the reference frame being link zero and this one being link two, that would be the instant center of link two relative to link zero. Um, but because that's pretty much the, the one we talk about most of the time, um, we just call it the instant center or the IC for short. So what does the IC mean at this instantaneous position? This member here is rotating and moving in a way as though it's rotating about this point in space. Any point along that line or any point on that member is moving in a direction that's perpendicular to a line from that point to the IC. So what's really interesting about this is we can kind of consider the axle path in two different ways. Um, in one sense, basically, this is a circular axle path because the pivot is, is on this member here, which is um, rotating about a single point there. So basically, the axle path is exactly like any other single pivot. Um, it's a circular axle path. Another way of looking at it is that the axle is in fact rotating about this instant center. Now, as, as we worked out, the instant center is basically derived by drawing a line through that, that lower link line and intersecting with a line through this upper link line. So that red dot is always gonna be on this line here. So it's always, always in line with that lower link. And what it means is that we could also consider that the axle is in fact following a path that is perpendicular to a line between the axle and that red dot. 
but that red dot's kind of moving all over the place. It seems strange that we can get this exact same circular axle path by having a line that um, intersects the red dot or joins the red dot to the axle. The axle is always moving perpendicular to that line. And we get the same axle path doing it that way as if you consider it being a fixed pivot and moving in a circular fashion there. So really the instant center of the axle could actually be anywhere along this line and you'd still get the same axle path. So that's a really important point that there are infinite instant center positions and paths that can result in this one axle path. So even if the instant center was hanging around up here somewhere, you'd still, as long as it stayed on that line, you'd still get the same axle path and therefore the same anti-squat curve. So what I'm trying to demonstrate is that there are infinite IC paths that will give you this this one axle path and this one anti-squat curve. And that's really key in, um, in understanding how we can tune anti-squat and anti-rise independently on these four bar systems. All right, so let's get into some optimization of a split pivot type suspension system and see what sort of advantages it has over a traditional single pivot system. Based on what we know about single pivots, we can expect that the anti-squat curve is going to be nearly linear. Um, so that's typical of these systems as well, because this axle path is basically generated by a single pivot. But now we can expect that we're going to have a lot more flexibility in tuning the anti-rise curve. We'll probably be able to um, tune the, the slope of the curve as well as the, the anti-rise value. So let's just set some target points. Um, let's say we just want 100% um, anti-rise roughly. Sorry, anti-squat 100%. And um, let's say, I don't know, 80 on um, anti-rise. We'll try and keep the motion ratio fairly linear. It's pretty, um, it's pretty flat at the moment already. And then we can set some boundaries. Uh, basically to ensure that it stays as a split pivot type system, um, we need to make sure that uh, this pivot point which is on the axle, can't actually move away from the axle. So um, that would be P3. So we'll just set that to zero. So that box has disappeared now. So we can hit optimize and see what we get. So that's not bad. We've got um, we've pretty much hit those motion ratio points. Um, we've hit the anti-squat and pretty close to hitting the anti-rise there. I might just um, open up this boundary a bit. and see if it improves the anti-rise here. A little bit, not much. So anyway, we've, we've gotten pretty close to our targets here on anti-rise and anti-squat. Um, 
Now if we change the anti-rise, but remember before we're going for a flat 80. Um, so let's go for a, a flat 100 now. And we're able to get that as well, even better than, um, than we could with the 80. And notice anti-squat is still hitting those values that we're asking for. So if you remember back to the single pivots, um, that's something we couldn't achieve with single pivots. Um, let's try and go, say, a flat 60. And so we've hit that as well. So as you can see, we're already getting a fair bit of flexibility out of this system. And um, the, the way we're able to do that is by having the brake caliper mounted on this, um, this link out here rather than on the swing arm. And um, the brake caliper now rotates about this virtual point, the instant center rather than a rotating about a fixed point. So it's, uh, it's really handy when we start working with virtual points that we can um, have move in a certain way because it gives us design flexibility. So let's see if we can get anti-squat to say be increasing. Got it increasing slightly, but I think we've um, probably hit the edge of the boundary we have there. So I'll just open up that boundary. So I've made a much bigger, huge, huge range. We'll just see where it wants to put that pivot. Radio. So we've nailed those targets and um, we're still hitting the anti rise targets. Let's try and go anti squat decreasing. So again, nailed those targets, still hitting the anti rise targets. Um, so let's try anti rise increasing. So it kind of struggles a little bit, but um, it's a pretty funky mechanism that it's come up with there. But um, it has done what we've asked, basically. It's, it's gotten an increasing amount of anti-rise through there. Let's try anti-rise decreasing. And it hasn't quite got the um, the downward slope that we asked for, but um, it, it does have a downward slope. It's done its best to achieve that. But overall, you can see how there's a lot more design flexibility tuning the anti-rise and anti-squat with this system um, because we're able to separate the, um, or position the, instant center in a, a virtual point in space, which allows us to separate the anti-squat from the anti-rise. So one of the drawbacks of this type of system is that we're now using this link and this link to control where the IC goes to control the anti-rise that we get. Previously, when we used um, a, like a single pivot system with a linkage actuated shock, like the Kona that we used in the first episode, this link and the rocker link 
were both dedicated to generating the motion ratio. Though those upper links previously had no effect on the anti-rise because the brake caliper was actually attached to the swing arm. Now that we've got the brake caliper attached to this link out here, um, we're using the geometry of this link and this link to help tune the anti-rise. Um, but those links are also responsible for tuning the motion ratio. So we now have a bit of a compromise um, between tuning the anti-rise and tuning the motion ratio. But it's probably not a great, as great a compromise as we had previously with tuning anti-squat and anti-rise. There was quite a limitation there previously with the regular single pivot. Um, we've still got a fair bit of independence in tuning the motion ratio here because we can choose where this um, upper shock I is. We can um, change the angle of um, how the rocker approaches the shock, which helps us um, tweak what the motion ratio will look like. Um, we can also reposition the bottom of the shock. That will help tune motion ratio, motion ratio only. Um, and we can also play with different shock strokes, which, um, which helps to tune the motion ratio as well. So I think um, this system is still superior to the um, linkage driven single pivot that we saw in the previous episode, uh, because the, we've got much greater flexibility in tuning the anti-rise and anti-squat and um, we've still got pretty good flexibility in tuning the motion ratio. If you were designing a bike with this, say using linkage, then um, there's a pretty good process for, um, for coming up with the kinematics that you want. Basically, first of all, you would um, change the location of this pivot to achieve the anti-squat curve that you want because it's it's only this lower link that affects the axle path and therefore the anti-squat. So tune that one first. Once you've got that pivot location sorted, then you can start playing with this pivot location and this pivot location to try and get the anti-rise um, curve that you want. Basically, when you're playing with this pivot and this pivot, you won't affect the anti-squat because that's already determined by this, um, this lower link, which is acting like a single pivot swing arm. So it means you can tune the anti-rise just by um, moving these two pivots, and it won't affect the anti-squat at all, which is a really convenient um, process to use. And then once you've got the anti-rise curve that you're after, or gotten as close to it as you can get within limitations, um, then you can start messing around with shock position to get the motion ratio curve that you're after. All right, so that's enough about um, split pivot type suspension systems. Um, I was hoping to get horse links into this episode as well, but um, obviously we're well over 30 minutes already. Um, so that's enough for one episode. So next episode, I'll talk about Horst link designs, which are quite similar to um, split pivots. And I might get on to short link four bars as well. We'll see how I go for time. I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. And feel free to shoot me any questions in the comments. Cheers. Bye.